uh, the land acknowledgement. Uh, we, uh, we acknowledge the traditional lands on which we are standing, the sacred home of the Black Confederacy and the indigenous people of Treaty 7, Southern Alberta, which includes the Sikasa, Pikani, Kainai, Tsina, and the Stony Nakota First Nations. Calgary is also home of the proud Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I also wish to acknowledge the 16 First Nations of Treaty 6 in Central Alberta, uh, that includes Edmonton. I'm just going to um, I'm looking is is Laura Sugimoto on today? No, I'm on for the Calgary. Oh, okay, Lester, you want to say a few words? Uh, sure. Uh, good morning. Uh, hi, I'm um, I'm Lester Ikuda, a member of the Calgary Buddhist Temple. Uh, we're lucky enough to be part of the group to host today's event. So welcome. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Jeff and Lillian for agreeing to talk about their illustration book today. And uh, thank you for all of you for joining us. Uh, I really enjoyed the book because it brings our heritage, heritage to life for um, children of all ages. And uh, parts of the story, you know, reminded me of myself in my childhood and past. Um, now, I'm not there yet, but all my three children have partners who are not Asian. And uh, I can see this book would be a must read, uh, hopefully for grandchildren who are yet to come. Um, again, thank you all for joining us and please enjoy Lillian and Jeff's talk today. All right, great. And, and Kelly, back, back to you. Uh, hi, um, welcome. I'm Kelly Kata. I represent the Japanese Cultural Association of Manitoba. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Ashinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people and home of the Métis First Nation. Um, it's a privilege for me to be involved uh, with this virtual event. Uh, I was so happy to meet both Jeff and Lillian. I found their last talk a few evenings ago to be outstanding. And it, it really does bring to light a lot of uh, the history, Japanese Canadian history that I thought I knew about, but clearly need to read more about. So welcome and I hope everyone learns something from today. Back to you, Roger. Great, thank you. And uh, Edmonton. Good morning. I'm Sanae from uh, Edmonton Japanese Community Association. And uh, we are so pleased that four associations groups are now together and doing something uh, together. That's very nice. Uh, one thing I would like to kind of talk to, well, tell to uh, Jeff and uh, Lillian is that I, as Jeff, you signed two books for me which I sent to Japan, and they, uh, they are researcher about the Japanese Canadian in Canada, uh, in Japan. <laughs> okay. And they are studying about the people who went back to Japan after the war. And oh. the, the book arrived just yesterday, and one of them emailed me saying, this book is excellent, particularly the say, uh, course content is very good, but say uh, English is very, how to say, easy to understand to Japanese people. Okay. And uh, yeah, they, oh, well, he also recommended this book be in Japanese too. Mm. And to have it in Japanese, I have two good things. One is to say, uh, people who came to Canada from Japan as a first generation, they don't know much about uh, the Japanese Canadians' history. And this book, even for adults, is easy to understand. And if it's in Japanese language, it's much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also nice for Japanese people who, does, who don't know much about the uh, Japanese Canadians in Canada. And it's a nice, very nice, easy introduction for them. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And now uh, I just uh, 
wanted to to mention that uh, as some uh, images uh, flashed up on the screen, I noticed uh, that we have some young readers who have joined us, and and that is excellent. Uh, that was our our hope that that we would actually uh, uh, get some of our our young young readers involved, not only in reading the book but also in hearing the the personal stories of uh, of uh, Jeff and Lillian. So to that end, I want to uh, just say a few, uh, very, very few words, but uh, uh, of introduction, Jeff uh, Chiba Stearns from the West Coast, uh, the author of uh, one of the collaborators on, on Being You Can Go. Uh, Jeff has been involved with many projects over the years, including some like, uh, What Are You Anyway? Uh, Yellow Sticky Notes, One Big Hapa Family, uh, Ode to a Post-it Note, and mixed match. Uh, and that last one is particularly significant, uh, uh, something that we watched uh, here in Calgary not that long ago. Lillian Michiko Blakey uh, has uh, uh, roots in Southern Alberta. Uh, and again, when uh, you hear her story, uh, as many of you have already said, you know, you, you'll uh, be reminded of uh, perhaps your own family's uh, stories. She is a business was a visual art teacher and a consultant with North York Board of Education. She has had her work on display at the Royal Ontario Museum and the Nikkei National Museum. So without any further delay, I'd like to call on Jeff to, uh, to, to uh, begin his presentation. Great, thanks Roger. Um, and thank you to everyone. Um, I know it's a, a very out of, uh, time zones that we're in right now, which is exciting and fun. Um, all the way, like I mentioned, uh, got uh, people joining us from London, um, not London, Ontario, but uh, the UK. So um, that's great. And um, I think that's sort of a true testament to, to sort of the universality of this book. I think that was mentioned um, by a lot of um, you in the beginning is that, you know, we want this book to be far reaching and to go international and to be able to tell the story in a very accessible way which is really why Lillian and I worked so hard to make sure that we could um, produce um, you know, a book that could be enjoyed by all ages. So the format of today's presentation um, is not gonna differ much from Thursday night because we have some new people here. Um, so we're just kind of trying to go through the same kind of um, presentation that we did on Thursday night, but um, we definitely are looking forward to the discussion and Q and A session that we'll have after following the presentation. So Lillian and I will both talk about our work um, and how it sort of pertains to the overall um, creation of On Being Yukiko, because really what we did in the past led up to the moment in which we decided we would collaborate together and um, how actually we were able to meet virtually and uh, create the book. An interesting fact is that Lillian and I have never met in person. Um, we have only ever communicated on phone, by phone and by email. And only just recently when we started doing presentations have we actually seen each other's faces uh, face to face via Zoom. So it's quite an interesting world in which we live because Lillian is based out in Ontario. I'm out in British Columbia, out in Vancouver. So um, yeah, it, it's really kind of neat that, that we can have this kind of a working relationship and never actually have to you know, meet in person. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to kind of start uh, going through basically a slideshow and I'll talk a little bit about my work. Then I'll pass it over to Lillian and she'll speak about um, her work. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about the collaboration and how we created on being with Kiko together. All right, uh, let's let's share the screen here. Let's see if this works. Okay, good. And share. All right. Does everybody see the uh, flyer for the PDF? Awesome. Great. Okay. Um, if you have questions too, um, maybe just hold on to those until the end so that we don't break the flow. We want to make sure we can kind of just get through this, and then we can have all the time we, we need for a discussion. Uh, hopefully over half an hour if all goes well, but um, here we go. Here's me. So uh, a fun fact is that Lillian and I, we decided in the book we would draw each, each other or we would draw ourselves in, in our own styles. So uh, these, uh, these are the portraits from the book. Um, I always start with this. I, um, this is a picture of me at probably age, I don't know, three or four maybe, it's hard to say. Um, I'm the little guy in the Wayne Gretzky number 99 t-shirt. And um, what was kind of fun is that, uh, you know, I, I grew up on an orchard and I was surrounded by a lot of family all the time um, because uh, my grandparents on my Japanese side, um, it was sort of like the meeting place for, for all of our families. 
And as you can see there, my uh, grandfather, um, Harry Chiba, he was an avid fisherman and he used to always bring home these massive uh, sockeye salmon. And I wasn't quite a fan of them, as you can see, <laughs> I'm standing next to uh, this fish that was about the same size as me. But what was interesting growing up in Kelowna was that all of my cousins were mixed Japanese as well. Um, something that I would learn later on, um, we could sometimes associate as being hapa. And I'll talk a little bit more about what hapa means in a second. So growing up in Kelowna, I went through a few kind of interesting sort of things as I was um, growing up. One of the things that sticks out most to me was this time, uh, it was the 80s in Kelowna. If you haven't been to Kelowna, it was pretty white during the 80s and there weren't any sushi restaurants. I think there was one and nobody really went there except for my family. And uh, it was multicultural day at school. I don't remember what grade it was, but it was probably two or three or something. And um, my mom decided, well, let's take sushi because we would eat futamaki rolls, um, you know, every New Year's or it'd be a special occasion when my grandma would make, make them. So we made them and took them to school and nobody, none of the kids, they would poke at them, but nobody tried it. And not even the teacher tried it. And I remember at the end of the day, there was this big, you know, full sushi tray of food. And um, I, I, I had to, my mom was picking me up from school and I thought, what do I do? So I, I put it in the garbage and told her everyone ate her sushi and then they loved it. And I felt really bad about that, right? Because I lied to my mom, but also, you know, it was sort of one of those periods where it really defined me, um, especially as a Japanese Canadian, you know, as sort of these racialized experiences. And these are the things that stuck with me. And over time, as a creative outlet, I started using a lot of these stories and collecting these stories um, and creating films and animations about them. So these are a lot of the works that I've done over the years. Uh, I've made nine films, uh, many of which are short animated uh, films. I have made two feature length documentaries. I'll talk a little bit more in length about that, but I've had a lot of really great success with the films. Um, some have been nominated for an Emmy. Um, I've been selected in over 300 film festivals and they've won, I think about over 45 festival awards. So as a filmmaker, um, you know, I'm still making films, but uh, it takes a lot longer, I think, sometimes to make feature length films, sometimes four or six years. So I'll talk a bit about the one big Hapa family in a second. But it all started out, I was at, took animation at the Emily Carr Institute of Art and Design. That's me in the middle. I always show this photo because I wanted to prove that I used to have cheekbones. Um, not so much anymore. But uh, yeah, it was a, a great time where I could learn and craft the skill of filmmaking, but also the craft of animation and uh, illustration. In uh, Emily Carr, I started uh, to work in a style that I would start um, utilizing more, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it, uh, I made these two uh, student films, um, and you could see the sort of the style that I was using was developing over time, but it really kind of turned into this sort of style that I coined as Hapanimation. And what Hapanimation is, is the uh, sort of, when I was younger, I was watching a lot of really badly dubbed Japanese animation. And um, now they refer to it as anime or manga. But um, I was also watching a lot of North American cartoon styles. So as I was developing my own style, what I was realizing is that being someone who's mixed Japanese and European descent, my style was actually becoming a blended and um, sort of morphing and, and, and mashed up sort of um, style as well. So it's kind of a blending of Japanese animation and North American cartoon styles. So, you know, North American cartoon styles have little kind of beady eyes, um, whereas the Japanese have kind of round sort of these sort of faces and big mouths, right? So it became this sort of hybrid style. And hapa, if you don't know, is a Hawaiian word that means part or half. And really around the, the sort of mid 90s, it became very popular uh, in the mainland um, as mixed, more mixed people were, were kind of coming up and trying to self-identify. They started using the term hapa to describe themselves. So it's sort of still being used within the community. It's not as popular as much anymore. Some people use hapu, some people use, um, you know, just mixed. But hapa um, was something that I was um, sort of, I gravitated to in the sort of late, I guess, 90s for me um, as something that I was like, oh, wow, there's actually something we can identify with um, in this sense. So this led me to doing my first professional film called What Are You Anyways? And for those of us who are mixed, uh, you know, this is the quintessential mixed race question for anyone who appears to be a little uh, mixed. Uh, it's the, what are you? And so I grew up with this question a lot. People are always curious because I didn't look full Japanese. They figured I must be something else or something other. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to formulate how to answer this question. And sometimes it was an annoyance and sometimes I liked that people were curious, but it's always sort of how do we deal and struggle with um, that in, relates, in relation to our identity. 
So in the film, it was really an exploration of all these experiences that I had growing up in Kelowna being mixed, you know, all the way up to all of my um, mom and her sisters, all married white guys and all of my cousins were mixed, but also just like what happened to me in elementary school, all the way up to being a teenager and up to meeting my wife, who's also mixed Japanese. And now we have cute little mixed Japanese babies. So we kind of joke and call them Hapa 2.0 or Super Hapas. But um, that film um, was great because it sort of brought me into the world of talking about multiracial identity or mixedness, especially in the Japanese Canadian community, because as you guys all know, 95% of all Japanese Canadians, um, there's a rate in which they intermarry. And that could be even higher. I think that was an NAJC stat that was taken quite a few years ago, even when I started One Big Hapa Family. But I thought I need to do a longer form film. And I liked the topic of exploring my family identity. And so at a family reunion, we had these big Japanese Canadian family reunions. You guys probably do too. Um, I realized that everyone in my family was mixed Japanese um, on, after my grandparents' generation. So my parents, all my mom and um, all of her sisters all intermarried. And then all of my cousins now were mixed and they were having more and more mixed kids too. So there was a point in our family where, you know, we were totally blended and there was really no going back from that. So that led me to kind of wanting to feature my family and figure out what happened to my big Hapa family. You know, why did we decide all of a sudden that we were going to become such a blended and mixed family? And how were we self-identifying as a Japanese Canadian family? And um, that was all explored in a film called One Big Hapa Family. I didn't do this last time, but I think I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna show the trailer. I'm not sure how many people have seen uh, One Big Hapa Family, but I think it's fun to kind of just see, it's a two minute trailer and uh, you'll be able to kind of maybe get a sense of, um, of what the film's about. So I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second and share the screen here and go to, oh, where is it? Oh, no, not there. Um, oh, here it is, okay, sure. Okay, I'm gonna try, try this. Let's see if it works. Are you guys hearing sound? Maybe we could uh, say it was because, because of the war and we had to break. We had to break our ties with Japan. And so we, we really went all about doing it. We were totally different, really, because you're different as much to me as I am different to you. And that's something that uh, I felt from uh, many years ago, that this was a way, like, we were going to marry a Caucasian. They call me sushi. Why do they call me sushi? They, there might be a day that comes when people say, yeah, I'm, what do you mean, I'm Canadian? I, I don't know. I don't know what else I am. So, yeah, there's, there's quite the mixture. So there's white, there's black, there's native, and then... Japanese. Little Indian Sioux are Crow, Little Frosty Eskimo, Little Turk are Japanese, but well, don't you wish that you were me? Well, don't you wish that you were me? And that was something that we took at school in the early grades, and it was supposed to be written by a, an English boy. to the presentation. So um, for those that hadn't seen One Big Hapa Family, uh oh, are we guys, are you guys see the, uh, my big Hapa Family over here? Yeah. Yes? Okay, yes. good. Um, yeah, so if you haven't seen One Big Hapa Family, um, there are links I can send you to, you can watch it online. Um, also, What Are You Anyways, you can watch on YouTube. So I've tried to make the films as accessible as possible. Um, but essentially it was an exploration of four generations of my Japanese Gadian family and how we were self-identifying and how we looked at some of our own family history. And that's me and my grandpa. Um, and uh, a lot of it was, you know, just sort of exploring, you know, what happened during the internment and afterwards and how, 
you know, the Japanese Canadian community so spread out across Canada, you know, how is this affecting, you know, intermarriage and how we were assimilating, I guess, in that, that regard. I traveled to New Denver, I got to check out the, the New Denver Memorial Center there. Um, I talked to my cousins, my parents, my, my grandma on my dad's side of the family. And really, it was just a, a good exploration. Um, and and uh, the film did really did really well. We had a lot of animation in the film as well. But um, I'd always bring this. Our world premiere of this film, One Big Happy Family, was in 2010 at the Calgary Film Festival. And uh, what was really amazing is that even then, um, I was getting a lot of support from the community as well. And um, they invited me, the Calgary uh, Japanese Canadian Association, brought me to the hall um, and we got to do a presentation there. So I always kind of factor this in because I know a few of you are from Calgary and it's always uh, great to um, kind of show you the places we've all been and uh, being able to actually visit a lot of these associations and uh, community centers um, in each of your communities, which has been really awesome that we've been able to screen one big half of family. Now, taking the film, I've been really fortunate too that I've been able to deliver the film at many universities. Um, a lot of my work we've shown at universities I've spoken at Harvard and Yale, um, and Cornell. And uh, it's been really great to connect with students. And I think that's been a, a huge benefit to being able to spread this story around is to be able to speak to students about it, um, because they are the next generation and creating content as they are graduating. So um, really lucky and fortunate. We had a lot of sold out screenings of One Big Happy Family for years at screen. We, we screened on, I think it played on the CBC. It was on a lot of um, other broadcast networks. And um, yeah, it just had a really far reaching um, effect. And I think even now, you know, it's still people are seeking it out and teaching it in schools. Um, this led me to doing another feature length documentary called Mixed Match. I like to just focus on this a little bit because it's an important issue, especially for our community because there are people who have leukemia or rare blood diseases who are mixed um, like ourselves that need uh, bone marrow matches or stem cell matches. And that usually will come from someone within our own community or similar mix as we are. So I wanted to make a film that highlighted that we just needed to raise awareness for this so that more mixed people, more people of ethnic diversities are joining registries. I was really fortunate the film took off as well too. We're getting covers of magazines and, um, but what was really important to me was that we had bone marrow drives at every screening. And that meant that we were signing up thousands of people to the national bone marrow registries after they watched the film. And because of that, we found out that many people actually got called to donate um, and we hopefully, like to think that many lives were saved. Uh, films I've done, like I said, you know, I'd be very fortunate that they have been, you know, found accolades, like uh, being nominated for Emmys and uh, other film festival prizes. But also, I think what was really great is that some of the film work now is being recognized um, through organizations like Canadian Blood Services. I was awarded uh, the Shilly Award and um, Be the Match with a Recognition Award. I also just received a cultural diversity award. So I think for me, it's really important as an activist, as much as I am an artist and an animator, to be able to focus on some of these stories within my own filmmaking and creativity. Here, here's my own little Hapa family. Um, so that's my daughter, Yuki, uh, my son, Takashi, and my wife, Jen. And um, this is taken probably a year ago. They're a little older now, but um, this really inspired the next step in my own creation, and that was making kids books. So when Yuki was three, I wanted her to see, you know, that she could read a book where maybe the ABC animals weren't just animals, they could be mixed up things like she was, so they could be many things. And I wanted her to self-identify with saying that animals couldn't, weren't just this or that, but they could be a multitude of things and be blended. So because of that, I started drawing on post-it notes. I, uh, I've done a lot of work on post-it notes, and some of you might know that. But um, essentially, this was the book. And there's my daughter Yuki at age three holding the book up. And the book was great. We got the, we had a distributor, they got it into chapters and a lot of kids bookstores. But for the most part, what was exciting was that, um, you know, here's an alligator, um, the Narus, and it was just fun mixing up animals. But what I thought was really exciting was that I was getting kids sending me their own interpretations of my mixed critters. And I think for any artist, um, this is the greatest form of um, compliment is to be able to inspire people to create their own works. And uh, having kids send me drawings was pretty much the reason why I made, started making kids books. This led me to doing the, the last kids book I just did, uh, which was uh, Nori and His Delicious Dreams, which is about a little mixed Japanese boy. He's kind of me, uh, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, when I used to think, uh, when I was a kid, I used to always think about sleeping in food. I don't know why it was a weird kind of thing, but um, it was important for me that, you know, he looked like what I looked like when I was a kid and that he had parents that looked like my parents, right? So he has a Japanese Canadian mom and a white father. 
and um, he has a obachan. Um, and I kind of focused a little bit on that in the story, but it really isn't so much about that as it's just about him sleeping in food. But I just wanted there to be re representation. I wanted a kid to open this up and be like, oh, hey, you know, like this little boy's like me, mixed. And um, I think we just need more of that in kids' books. So as you can see here, these are some of the drawings. These are early preliminary drawings that I did. You can kind of see I was kind of exploring the look. And in the end, I kind of settled on this. And um, yeah, he just kind of, this little boy whose name is Nori um, is sleeping in sushi and shumai. And it's a great way to kind of introduce kids to different foods from all around the world. And ramen, of course, everyone's favorite, at least my favorite. And um, I always end by saying this, I have found bliss. You know, in my entire, you know, last 20 years of creation and making things, I haven't worked a single day in my life. And um, the opportunity that I've had to be able to visit communities and speak to people um, or, you know, around the world about the work I do is basically the reason why I feel like I have found bliss. So um, with that being said, I'm going to conclude my presentation and pass it over to Lillian, which is lunchtime uh, out there in Ontario, isn't it? Lillian, I think, are you muted? Yeah. Oh, you're back. Okay, I can hear you. Great. Oh, is this, uh, oh, uh oh, wait. Sorry, Lillian, I got to pull your presentation up. I just realized that I have the wrong one. So bear with me for one second, please. Um, and I'm going to get my presentation up and running here for you. Um, some reason that was the wrong one. We have updated it since, um, and I had it on my on my, okay. this is the problem with me is I've got a billion files. I'm trying to now, I'm gonna find this. Okay, presentations, Manitoba, Calgary. Uh, is this the new one? Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna hope this is it. Sorry guys. I went in and I think I updated something by doing that. Uh-oh, I did. Okay. Um, can you just bear with me one second? I'm going to save this as a PDF. Um, yeah, oh, here it is. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. I think I've got your presentation, Lillian. Sorry, guys. Um, oh, can you guys see this now? I, I have screen sharing on, right? Window and view full screen. Okay, Lillian, can you see your family? Yes. Good. Okay. I think we've got your presentation now then. Okay. Okay. Great. You want to start? Okay. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. The history of my family in Canada is almost as long as the history of Canada itself. In this uh, family photo, we see my paternal grandparents, Kiruhichi Yano and Takako Yano, with their three sons. They were both born in Kikuchi Ken, Kumamoto, Japan. My father, Hisashi, was born in 1910 in Port Moody, British Columbia. He is the baby in his mother's arms. Both of his parents were dead by the time he was seven. Next. My grandmother made a living making tofu after her husband passed away in 1912. She died in the great flu epidemic of 1918. Next. My maternal grandfather, Mitaro Hamaguchi, immigrated to British Columbia in 1900 when he was only 20 years old and Canada was only 33 years old. He became a Canadian citizen in 1907. In 1913, Maki Teramoto became his picture bride. They both came from Kumamoto, Japan. They had three daughters, Eunice Kinue, Lily Reiko, and Rosie Akie. Next. My mother, Lily Reiko, was born in 1923. Next. When war broke out against Japan in December 1941, my family lost everything and were forced to relocate to Lethbridge, Alberta to unimaginable hardship working in the sugar beet fields. Here is my mom. Next. My mother had been engaged to Roy Hisashiyano before they left to go to Alberta. My family had, had been sent to work Sorry, my father had been sent to work in a road camp at Griffin Lake. In 1944, he finally received permission to go to Alberta to marry my mom. Next. All Japanese Canadian adults were fingerprinted like criminals and had to carry identification cards at all times. 
Mom's name was spelled incorrectly, but she was too afraid to, to correct them. She was only 19. Next. I was born in 1945. Here I am with my grandparents before they relocated to Japan in 1946, just after these photos were taken. Next. Here we are in the frigid Alberta winter. My sister, Marianne Kilko, was born in 1946 after my mom's family all left for Japan. Next. Here we are finally in, Al in, in Ontario in 1952 at our first Canadian National Exhibition. Next. My parents never talked about what happened during the war. They wanted my sister and me to grow up as Canadians without the darkness of our family's past. I just knew something bad had happened. So I grew up denying the Japanese part of me, like many other sansei. But everything that we experience growing up does have an effect on how we go out into the unknown world. And all of the people before us are part of us as well. I am Canadian. I am Japanese. In many ways, I am the same as a person of mixed race. Each part of me hated the other. It was not until the acknowledgement and redress was signed on September the 22nd, 1988, by then Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and Art Miki, that I began to understand who I am. Next. In my professional art career, I sporadically searched for my identity. In 1975, a piece from my first solo exhibition, Mirror, is a portrait of my two selves. At the time, I wrote a preface which explored my dilemma of being two people in one. Mirror is an introspective piece which attempts to express my ambiguous feelings resulting from belonging to two very different cultures. It is a highly symbolic work. The two women are really one, as if one of them is looking at a mirror image of herself. Both are Asian. One is in Western dress and the other is in a Japanese kimono. But who is the real person and who is the image in the mirror? Next. For most of my art career, I created images in my mind, often using family members as models. My Japanese Canadian family appear in scenes of Canadian life, but make no, no connections to my family's past. This painting, in silent spaces between the notes, I stand outside myself and watch, alludes perhaps to my feelings of being an outsider as a Canadian, but not fully a Canadian. The model is one of my biracial twin daughters. Next. My work often expressed the archetypal experience of isolation. Morning prayer is a comment on how the world has seemingly replaced spiritual rituals with mundane ones. The morning prayer replaced by the morning commute, each person isolated and alone in a crowd. I have included my mother and sister in this work. This painting is in the Government of Ontario art collection. Next. I painted Shkatakanai, It Can't Be Helped, Alberta, 1951 in 2001, 13 years after redress. It was my very first expression of my family's story. It is my own memory of the sugar beet fields of Alberta, where my family toiled endlessly from dawn until dusk. I see myself hiding behind my Anglo doll. My clean white dress contrasts sharply with this life of toil. It is a reminder of the city life my parents were forced to leave. Next. 37 years after World War II and 24 years after redress had, had passed before I had the courage to have a solo exhibition about my family story at the Canadian, uh, Japanese Canadian Cultural Center in Toronto. It was curated by Bryce Kambara. And I think you should all know now that um, he is the 20, uh, 2021 recipient of the Governor General's Award for outstanding community service in visual arts. Next. 
Hanging prominently in the foreground is a large portrait of myself as a young woman, wannabe. It is a sumi drawing on sho shoji paper. I am hiding behind an Im image of Marilyn Monroe, whose famous face is ironically on a Japanese fan. More than anything, I wanted to be blonde and white. I was very nervous about showing art which focused on the injustice against Japanese Canadians living in British Columbia during the war. Next. Gaijin Foreigner, Strangers in Our Own Land is an interactive installation of 48 images accompanied by excerpts from written accounts by my mother and her sister of the forced removal. Next. Viewers could lift the images to read the words under each of them. Next. It touched my heart when many elders came to me after they had read the words under each of the 48 images and said with tears in their eyes, thank you. That's exactly what happened to my family. Next. This is one of the works. It is the wedding photo of my grandparents, Nitaro Hamaguchi and Maki Teramoto. My grandmother was a picture bride. She came to Canada to marry a man she had never met in 1913. He had come in 19, 1900 and became a Canadian citizen in 1907. Next. Here, my mom's family pose in front of the Alberta cabin in which all nine of them lived. My mom wrote in her memoirs, when Japan joined Germany against us, the Canadian government forcibly uprooted the Japanese Canadians from the West Coast. We were given the choice of having women and children go to internment camps and men to, re to road camps or to stay together as families and go to sugar beet farms in Alberta. Mother wanted our family to be get together, so we decided to be evacuated to Alberta. Next. My mom wrote on thinning the beets. The beets were planted in thick rows about three feet apart. When the plants were about an inch high, we thinned them down to single plants about a foot apart, all the way down the rows, row after row after row. Next. She continues. We often worked alongside German prisoners of war who are very pleasant young men. There were always Canadian soldiers with guns standing at the end of the end of the row, guarding them. I found out that the Germans could understand French, so we were laughing and having a great time. The soldiers grew suspicious and reported the Germans. We did not see them for several days. They were punished for talking to me. Next. In this work, From Enemy Alien to All You Can Eat Sushi, I am looking at the experience through my eyes. Here, I see myself as a child standing behind a barbed wire fence. Even children of Canadian-born parents of Japanese heritage were considered enemy aliens. Behind me is the order issued by the Canadian government to move us inland, away from the coast. The irony is that now sushi, along with Japanese cars, is enormously popular. There are sushi restaurants on every corner and in every grocery store, offering to the Canadian public all the sushi they can eat. I had never thought that I would see this dichotomy in my lifetime. Next. There are a ton of Hollywood movies about World War II in the 1950s. Here, I feel targeted. I want to shout to the world. I am not a Jap. I am not a geisha. I am not a yellow peril. I am not an enemy alien. I am a Canadian. Next. To the Japanese, everything an individual does reflects on the entire community. After forced relocation, they felt that if they behaved as perfect Canadians, they would once again be accepted as members of Canadian society. This work is reminiscent of a want wanted poster. Next. In 2019, the Royal Ontario Museum, North America's largest museum, presented a six month exhibition. The Japanese Canadian story was finally an important part of the history of Canada. 
Here is what the ROM stated in its press release. The Royal Ontario Museum is pleased to present the contemporary art installation, Being Japanese Canadian, Reflections on a Broken World, featuring works by eight Japanese Canadian artists from across the country, Being Japanese Canadian, explores multi-generational responses to the exile, dispossession, and internment of Can Canadian citizens of Japanese descent during the 1940s. Designed as a series of artworks interspersed throughout the Rom S Sigmund Samuel Gallery of Canada, Being Japanese Canadian reflects on a period of Canadian history that is explored through the deeply personal narratives of eight contemporary artists grappling with the effects of the internment era. This compelling artistic examination of our shared national history furthers the discussion of multiculturalism and belonging in today's society. This installation is a collaboration between curate, curators from the ROM and the Japanese Canadian community. I was one of the eight artists. Next. The opening reception of the ROM exhibition, Being Japanese Canadians, Reflection on a Broken World, was attended by an audience of more than 400. Here, Bryce Kambara is giving the opening address. Bryce was also a member of the redress team led by Art Miki. Next. In 2008, I painted Reiko, Alberta, 1945, after my mother's death. She is wearing a city woman's blouse, looking at the viewer with a steady but not condemning gaze. In front of her is the barbed wire fence around the sugar beet field where she worked from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day for months until the beets were harvested. The blue sky represents hope. This painting was chosen to be the signature image for the ROM exhibition. Next. Two other works were in the ROM exhibit. Taking the Nancy, British Columbia, 1942, depicts the RCMP confiscating my, my grandfather's boat. I include myself in the work, looking back at the scene. In Barry Broadfoot's book, Years of Sorrow, Years of Shame, my Aunt Eunice recounts. My father had just repainted his boat and had the engine rehauled. My daughter was only a year old at the time, so he renamed his boat Nancy after her, and he was so happy. Then the government just took it, and he never got anything for it. I don't know what happened. Next. My third piece was Canadian Born, Alberta, 1942, which shows my mom in the sugar beet field with her fingerprinted identification card behind her. Next. In 2020, all of my works are large installations on shoji paper. In mixed blessings, I am tied to my children and grandchildren who are the best part of me. They are also the end of my Japanese heritage, both genetically and culturally. I did not pass on the little that I know about my people. I am, therefore, the end of my Japanese line. But I celebrate the fact that they are a new kind of people, children of the world. My, my grandchildren carry the DNA of ancestors from far corners of the world. Japanese, English, Irish, French, Scottish, Dutch, German, Jamaican, Egyptian, and African. Perhaps when the whole world is filled with children of the world, it will truly be a world of mixed blessings. This work suggests the ever-changing journey of my family from Japanese Canadian to a global family. Perhaps it will be a better world when everyone is mixed race. As human beings, we are all related and future generations of my family in Canada will be citizens of the world. Next. When I first started this installation, it was meant to be a homage to the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Three days after the bomb fell, the black rain with the re remains of the radiation in the air fell down on the survivors. This work was also an analogy for the pandemic, the darkness of isolation, alienation, and death. The title was going to be Behold the Black Rain. 
But as I worked on the 10 foot panels, my vision changed from apocalypse to salvation. The two side panels became symbolic of hope, the rain changing into silver, pushing out the blackness and the title became silver lining. Next. My work is becoming increasingly abstract. This 15 foot installation is called Sticky Rise 22,000, out of the darkness, into the darkness. Each grain of rice represents one Japanese Canadian forcibly relocated. Most went into internment camps in the Rockies. Many went to the prairies to hard labor, but others were spread out across Canada. I embedded the words, my father always said, you should not waste a single grain of rice, not one single grain. Next. In 1995, I asked my mother to write her story for her grandchildren. I am so happy she did, or I would not be able to do the work that I'm doing today. Next. In 2019, I wrote and il illustrated my grandmother Maki's story, The Picture Bride, which I sent to Jeff Chiba Stearns to see if an animated version could be created. Later, we decided that a graphic novel, which incor incorporate incorporates the past, present, and future would be the most exciting form for young people. Ambi Yukiko was the result of our collaboration. Next. Maybe now, after this very long creative journey, I am able to see how much my, my dual identities as both Canadian and Japanese are equally who I am. I now know that the issue of identity is constantly changing and that knowing about the past informs who I am as a human being. Okay, Jeff, can you uh, talk to people about uh, the uh, about how we created it? Sure, I'm gonna pull up uh, the other part of the presentation here and I'm going to full screen mode it. There we go, okay. All right, there we go. Um, great, thanks Lillian. Um, I feel like every time you present that, even though I've seen it a few times, I glean new information. So uh, like I said, it's it's really nice to to basically, uh, yeah, understand the artistic journey that it takes sometimes um, that is inspired by family history and how it can be a creative factor in the way we create, which is why I think it was really special when Lillian reached out uh, through email and just said, hey, Jeff, I've seen One Big Happy Family. I like your work. Um, let's work together. And I've seen Lillian's work. It's hanging at the Nikkei National Nikkei Museum. And so I've also seen on the cover of the bulletin. And so I have realized that, you know, I'm like, yeah, this is probably a really cool thing if we're able to come together to create a project. And as Lillian mentioned, we thought about doing an animation, but animation is long and tedious and costly. So we figured, you know, maybe it would be good to collaborate in a way that, you know, I could have input, Lillian could have input, and we could actually work together to create something that was unique, but still captured, um, you know, Lillian's story, uh, her family story within the book. So Anya Kiko was born. And, um, it really came from um, Lillian's book, The Picture Bride, which I actually have a copy of right here. And when she sent the book, you know, it's filled with like 60 amazing illustrations that she has done over, you know, a span of time that really captures her own family history based on her mother's book and um, really highlights the story of her, her grandmother, Maki's uh, story as well. So you can see here at the very beginning, when we pitched the idea or when Lillian sort of was like, yeah, we should do a graphic novel. I'm like, great idea, because there wasn't really a graphic novel that was in the space that tackled identity, Japanese gaining an identity, as well as Japanese gaining history. And so um, I just got drawing. I, I was really inspired. It was almost inspired the second she mentioned graphic novel. And, um, you know, I was thinking, okay, I do have animated style. So, you know, how's this going to look? How's this going to work with Lillian style? Because as you saw, Lillian style is very photorealistic at times, very mixed media. And so um, I realized that it doesn't matter. Let's just work in our own styles and it should just work. And luckily we found that uh, most people find that it does work. So you can see this is, this is like a page that I did um, solely by myself where I just sort of created the characters. We decided we would incorporate um, some of Emma, who's the main character's friends, because I realized that I, as I was growing up, I couldn't always speak to my parents about my own mixedness because they weren't mixed, right? They were quote unquote monoracial. 
And so they would never understand what it was like as a little mixed kid growing up. Um, so we wanted to give Emma some friends that she could communicate with so they could talk about mixed identity with each other. And I'll talk a little bit about that more in a second. But again, here's Emma and her grandma, which is uh, a little bit based, uh, I guess, uh, on Lillian um, as I was drawing the character because it is technically Lillian as she would communicate to maybe one of her granddaughters, right? So again, on being Michiko um, was sort of an inspiration that led into um, the initial story. Um, and as Lillian said in her presentation, a lot of what happened, um, you know, that she was depicting in her own artwork and um, in her mother's story made it into this book because obviously we wanted to tell a real story, you know, a historically accurate story, as well as create maybe a fictionalized story in the present of how a grandmother might talk to or tell the story to her granddaughter. So it's kind of a mix of fiction and um, factual in that sense. But what ended up happening was I said to Lillian, yeah, just send me the rough script that you have in your mind of what we could do. And then I just sort of took that and was like, okay, let's lay this out into pages and panels. And um, it was really kind of a fun way of working because we didn't really always know where we were going or what direction we were taking. And when I started the project, I just started with page, actually I started with the cover. I did the cover first. And I was like, oh, this looks cool. And then I did page one, two, three, four, five, six. It was all chronological in order. It was supposed to be 48 pages, but we realized the story was extending past that as I was just kept going. So we ended up with 56. But, um, you know, I think that was just, it was not, not a way that I would ever really encourage anyone to work. But for me, it was uh, motivating um, as I was kind of just going forward one page at a time. And as I tackled one page at a time, we could think of creative solutions as well. So, you know, even the titling um, that we use, we wanted to kind of give it a hand-drawn feel because so much of the, the Lillian's work is hand-drawn. So my wife actually is pretty good at uh, doing calligraphy. So she, she did the title for us. Um, but it starts off really with just Emma um, as she struggles with a little bit of that sense of who am I, right? I think we all sort of have felt that way, even if we aren't mixed. You know, I think all of us have sat there on our bed and just thought about it, you know, and at age 12, it's that pivotal time, I think, in a lot of adolescents' lives, youth lives, where we think, yeah, you know, like, I have a Japanese grandparents, I've got, you know, white grandparents, and, you know, what is it for me to be Japanese, especially Japanese Canadian? You know, especially because we're not looking as Japanese as we used to, right? So, as I was kind of creating the book, this is a bit of uh, how I, I approached it. You know, I would lay the book out really rough, then I would kind of ink it over. And I did a lot of the, uh, the work actually digitally. So it was, this, it was meant to look hand-drawn, but it actually was done in a computer. And then I colored it up in the computer as well. And um, you can see there we laid the text down. So that's sort of the, the process of working. Now, what was interesting is I had this wealth of Lillian's artwork, right? She sent me, you know, 60 PDF or, or like high-res files of her work scanned in. And I thought, great, how do I incorporate this into the book? And so the challenge for me was just to lay it out. And what was really fun is that we could find creative ways to lay the book out. And so I like the idea of creating different panels. What was great about Lillian's work is that it all was rectangular anyways, or square. So it kind of worked as panels. And then we wanted to kind of just bring in the idea that it was a storybook feel too. So anytime Lillian was kind of going back and talking about her family history, it was just a box. So we could kind of fit that in next to the panels. And as you can see here from the layout, you know, it's, it's a nice eclectic mix of my style with Lillian's style. But every time we transport back in the past, you always know it's Lillian's style because it's so inherently Lillian's style. Um, so we, we think that's what really worked in this sort of intergenerational kind of way that we were working is that we each had our own style that was reflected in the historical and the present. Um, so you can see here some, here's some more panels. And we really started off right in the very beginning, you know, when Lillian's um, Mackie, uh, her great her grandmother, um, came over. Um, essentially, we start right back in the early 1900s, right? And uh, it was a picture marriage, right? So um, when she arrives in Canada, you know, it wasn't what she expected. And it was, that's really true to a lot of picture brides that came over as they were expecting something a little different, I think, going to a, a foreign land. Um, and you can see as Lillian's um, drawings, they actually worked really well when they're lined up as a panel as well. So in a comic book format, it just kind of worked, right? And already Lillian already had kind of graphic um, sort of comic styles in there because she already had these sort of thought bubbles that were already popping up in that Picture Bride book. So it kind of just lent itself very well to being a comic. And as you can see here, as we go through, um, sometimes I use Lillian's images as a whole splash page is what we call it when we sort of um, incorporate her work into an entire page. And then sometimes again, um, we just find kind of neat sort of ways of laying out the book so that, um, you know, my work can kind of blend with her work. 
So again, um, what was nice about this story is that it was all encompassing, right? It takes us through an entire journey of what a Japanese Canadian family would have gone through um, up until, you know, from the early 1900s up until, you know, now. And um, it's very parallel, I think, to a lot of your families as well as my family. Uh, my family came here in around 1907 as well. And so, but they relocated and settled in more of the um, Okanagan area. So whereas I wasn't familiar so much you know, I, over time I am, but growing up, I wasn't familiar with the internment um, because my family was in Kelowna. And during that period, um, you know, in the Okanagan, Japanese Canadians were not um, relocated. And so it was, you know, a minority group that weren't, but there were still a lot of issues that came up that I explored in one big Kappa family. But as you can see here, a lot of pivotal moments in Lillian's family are highlighted, you know, with working in a cannery or the time when Lillian's uh, mother was uh, crowned the May Queen. Um, during uh, Queen Victoria's birthday, uh, during May Days. And that was the first time a Japanese Canadian had ever received that honor. And so they're kind of like small wins, I think. So we wanted to make sure we were highlighting positive um, along with the hardships. But with Emma's story, we introduced characters like Nathan and Annika. Um, and Nathan sort of identifies as mixed, um, you know, black, I guess, in that sense. And he has a Nigerian mother and a white father. And we wanted to say, okay, you know, it's not always just a Japanese white mix, you know, you can have other mixes as well too, but also with Annika being quote unquote white, um, she's still identified as mixed because her parents were first generation um, Norwegian and Ukrainian, and she's living in Canada. And sometimes they refer to that as a third culture kid because she's being, um, I guess she's experiencing three cultures in her household, right? Being Canadian, Norwegian, and Ukrainian. And so there's a sense of mixedness there too. And as Lillian even attested to growing up, she felt quite mixed as well because, you know, a lot of that um, generation, um, Sansei generation, um, didn't learn the language and was sort of navigating between those spaces as well. Um, so myself being Yonsei, um, obviously, my appearance is not as Japanese as the Sansei's or my mom's generation. And so, you know, I have different, you know, struggles and different, you know, issues that I've dealt with, but also traveling to Japan for me is different um, because people don't see me as being Japanese. So they're not trying to speak Japanese to me, right? Uh, whereas the Sansei generation, they might go to Japan and they just don't speak the language, but they feel more alienated because they don't. Um, and that's the kind of experience, like my mom, she's never really had a, um, a you know, a need or a want to, to travel to Japan. And I think that's quite a common experience. So we have that kind of discussion in the book, you know, what it's like if she were to go to Japan and how she wouldn't fit in because she never learned the language and her mother never learned the language. And even for me, I never learned the language. And that was really a loss, I think, for me and my family and something that I'm trying to bring back with my kids. So um, again, the book transitions into the war period, you know, and, and um, talks a lot about what Lillian talked about in her presentation, where, you know, the the boat was taken away and their family had to pick uh, on what they had to do or what they wanted to do. It wasn't much of a choice. It was being turned or go to Alberta and they chose Alberta. So we captured that in the book as well. And you can see um, as Elaine showed you earlier, um, the um, ID cards. And we wanted to incorporate some of that history into the book. So again, the book itself became a bit of a time capsule and a way we could kind of present um, a lot of this um, history. Um, Again, showing the life and uh, through Lillian. So kind of showing how, you know, they were living in a shack, right? That was, um, uh oh, it says my internet's unstable. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, you know, and that's partly a tricky thing um, because, you know, Oops. Have we lost Jeff? We've lost you, Jeff. I'm a family home um, in Japan. And also what little, you know, get, gets talked about is how a lot of Japanese Canadians um, were basically exiled to Japan after World War II. And uh, for Lillian's family, that happened. Um, her family did go to Japan, and I don't want to say back to Japan, uh, because some of her family was born in Canada and still went to Japan. And um, 
you know, so when we think about Lillian's family's story, it really is all encompassing in terms of it tells the full story of what would have happened to a Japanese Canadian family over the course of that period. You know, whether you got to stay in Canada or not, it didn't matter. It still encompasses the fact that a lot of her family did end up going to Japan and suffering greatly afterwards. We wanted to make sure that we left on some hope. So we talked about the redress. And as Lillian um, sort of was working through her illustrations she had in the past, we had to do a little bit of updating because some of the feedback we had was that we wanted to focus on more of the females, uh, the women who were part of that movement as well. And so Lillian was able to revisit some of those drawings and actually include a little more of, of them as well as highlighting um, some of that story. So the feedback we got was really great um, from a lot of people uh, who pre-read the book in the early draft phase and we were able to make a lot of adjustments. It actually took us longer to edit the book than it did to make the book. We started in when it was just pre-COVID, it was around COVID time, um, just when COVID hit, which was actually why we made the book, because we were like, oh, what a great time to start a project because we're all kind of in lockdown. You know, this is probably a great thing to just focus on. And luckily for Lillian and I, we were able to do that. And um, it was actually a great project to do. And it didn't take us that long. I could do two or three pages sometimes a day. Um, sometimes I do a page a day, but 56 pages, it took about, you know, I'd say three months to get the book um, kind of finished. And you can see here, you know, sometimes I would incorporate some artwork of older artwork I had of Koi into the book. Um, here's some more pages at the end. And this is where they're discussing um, how their family ended up in Ontario after um, being in the sugar beet farms for almost 10 years after the war ended because they couldn't afford to move. Um, you know, it was one of those kind of very difficult things um, to actually want to leave the area, but they because they couldn't. Um, lastly, we just wanted to leave on hope as well, too, that um, Emma, who has a Japanese name, uh, Yukiko, decides that she does take pride in her Japanese Canadian roots, and she does want to embrace that, and she wants to learn more about it. And in the end, she decides that she would rather go by Yukiko, um, and she's proud of that. And I think, you know, I'm not saying that everyone needs to find that sense of pride, but I think it's nice that we can highlight when that moment happens. I was never... You know, growing up, I wasn't Jeff Chiba Stearns. Um, it wasn't until I did What Are You Anyways, where um, I decided it was important to honor my Japanese Canadian side and take my my grandfather's surname because, you know, he had all daughters. And so no one took his, you know, his surname wasn't um, passed on. So I felt it important to take it on as Jeff Chiba Stearns. And I think that moment happens in a lot of our lives. A lot of my cousins have taken on the Chiba name as well. I passed it on to my son. Um, and I think that's something that as a community, um, you know, we are gravitating towards more of this sort of um, embracing of, of our histories and our heritage. So as you can see, we put a lot of glossary terms in the book because we wanted people to learn more. Um, and as Lillian will kind of talk about, um, she spent a lot of time, uh, an immense amount of time creating a curriculum guide and teaching pl lesson plans for teachers because we want this book to end up in schools. That's the ultimate goal is that this book gets taught in schools forever, just like Obasan and Joy Kogawa's book. We want this book to be the resource for um, elementary school children and middle school children um, so that they learn about this history. We don't want this history to be lost or forgotten um, because so much can be learned um, from not repeating this ever again. So a lot of those uh, terms that are in here, like racial profiling that we talk about and also third culture kids, but also internment camps. And this was really great because we had a lot of help from um, the National Nikkei Museum, Landscapes of Injustice on helping kind of craft these glossary terms. So, uh, you know, kids can learn a little bit more about that uh, accurately because a lot of times research is changing and evolving. Now reviews, we had great reviews. We had Joy Kogawa came on board early on and really endorsed the book. She, she just sent an email a few weeks ago saying how she holds the book and cuddles it like a, a puppy and just wants to gnaw at it. And, and it's such a poetic way of saying that, but um, she tells us that she keeps it proudly displayed on her, on her mantle. So when people come over, which they haven't because of COVID, um, they can see the book, but that warms our heart. That, that I, I know for Lily and I, you know, when people say things like that and send us emails, um, it just, it encourages us that we had spent the time we did in, in, in a good way to create this for everyone. So Art Miki, and we wanted to make sure that the quotes we had were also intergenerational. So Art and his daughter, um, actually his granddaughter um, gave us a quote, same with Joy and um, her granddaughter gave us a quote as well too. 
And um, uh, Tamil Campos, who is David Suzuki's grandson, gave us a quote with his grandmother. And Mary Kitagawa, um, she's, a, she's a huge um, champion of the book as well too, uh, has been very supportive and given us quotes. So we encourage you to, um, to give us quotes or reviews um, and you can actually uh, do that if you go to Goodreads and just type in on being in Kiko. I think we've got 22 reviews so far. So it really helps us out if you guys wanna go on and leave a nice review for us and write the book because teachers and educators and librarians will go there and see that and realize, oh, hey, people actually like this book. Well, we're gonna order it for our, our classes. Big thank you to all the Japanese gaming associations that came on board early on to help us because this is, book is independent. We decided that early on we were not gonna get a publisher because we didn't want to have a publisher getting their hands in and changing things and editing our book. Um, and also we wanted the book to come out in a timely fashion. Usually if you get a publisher, it takes four years um, before a book will ever reach the public. Um, we were able to get the book out in like seven or eight months. So we started in March of last year. The book was ready for Christmas, December. Um, you know, it's unheard of in the publishing world. So we self-published the book, independently published it. And because of that, we had great support from National Association of Japanese Canadians and all the groups you see there, including the ones on our presentation today. So thank you so much. Um, really great support. The Bulletin has given us front covers, the Nikkei voice. The community has really embraced the book and we can't thank everyone enough for that. The CBC just did a feature on me and the books I make for the kids, uh, my children. Um, so now it's getting national coverage. So that's great. You know, for us as, as independents, this is the greatest thing we could ever expect. If you order books uh, through any of us, the associations and myself, I will methodically sit there and draw a little picture of uh, Yukiko and uh, write something in there and sign it. Um, I think I've signed over a thousand books so far. Lillian's done a few hundred herself, I'm sure. And um, yeah, we want to say uh, a lot of the associations um, have copies of the book that they've gotten in bulk. So you can get those books through them, um, save, the, save the shipping costs. Um, just get a hold of Roger and Kelly and uh, Sane, or Sane um, and they should uh, be able to get you guys books. I know some of them might've been selling out. If not, you can get the books uh, through uh, this website, uh, meditatingbunny.com slash door. Uh, and uh, if you do it through there, you know, I can, I can personalize it for you if you want, I guess, you know what I mean? So just leave a note uh, when you're ordering. But um, yeah, it's, 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 nice, it's a nice hardcover book. I'll show you when I come off the presentation. Um, again, here's the website. Uh, you can also order ebooks as well. So if you don't want to pay for shipping and you just want to read the book, there are ebooks. You can go on Amazon and order the ebook as well for Kindle. Um, that's, our, that's our plug for today. But um, also important to note, we want this book to be read by as many people as possible. And we've already had a lot of libraries order the book, um, which is really great for us. And a lot of schools are ordering the book. But if you, and what's awesome now is that we have a distributor who's going to get the book into chapters and um, in the, it's already in kids bookstores, it's in bookstores, and it's starting to get more and more. So if you know anyone, uh, Sand Hill Books is our distributor. There's the email address or the, um, the address right there, the web address. You can send a bookstore to them um, and they can order, the bookstore can order um, through Sand Hill Books and get the books through Sand Hill at a wholesale. So, um, and we also encourage libraries and such to do. So if you guys want, um, we really love that if, if you order books, um, you know, pick up a copy for your library or school library, you know, um, just because we want the book to be far reaching and uh, be accessible. I think the Burnery Library has bought four copies and they're, they're on hold, like constantly on hold. So we're super excited. That, that made me happy because I'm from Burnaby and I, uh, someone was like, I can't even get your book. It's on hold. I was like, oh, okay. So um, if you want to learn more about Lillian, um, her website is blakeyart.ca um, and uh, it's a great place to go to learn more about the ROM exhibition and a lot of the prior work that Lillian has done. Um, you can visit mine. It's at uh, meditatingbunny.com, same place you go if you want to buy the books um, or get a hold of your associations. But yeah, that's on being Yukiko. And uh, thank you for tuning in to our presentation. I'm going to, and also, um, Follow us on Instagram. That's the best way to keep in touch with us as well, too, or at least me. Um, it's at Meditating Bunny or on Being Yukiko. Um, if you're on Instagram, follow us. Um, and uh, it's the best way to keep in touch, uh, definitely through the direct messaging that you can do. So with that being said, we've got about 20 minutes. Uh, I would love 
uh, to have a discussion with everybody and see everybody. So if you if you guys feel inclined and you want to turn your cameras on, if you feel comfortable, great. If not, that's fine. I'm sure you're, some of you are still wearing pajamas. Um, I like that Lillian and I, we color coordinated today. Good work, Lillian. Uh, we're both wearing red and black. I don't know how that happened, but uh, nice, nice job. Um, but yeah, I want to thank all of you uh, for, for taking the time to join us today. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll take questions. I don't know if there were there any questions in the comments that we wanted to address. There, someone said make a second book. Lillian has two ideas for a second book, and I know she's been. Uh, they came to her in a dream. So um, we are thinking about it. Um, we are definitely busy uh, lately. I've, I've taken on a few other gigs, but um, I think if there's demand, we will. And and as as was mentioned, we do want to get the book translated to Japanese. I think that would be a great thing to have as a resource for those in Japan and beyond. Um, so we just, it takes time, it takes resources, it takes energy, and it takes funding. So, you know, once we sell more books and we can kind of reinvest in that. Um, but I think right now our main focus is really on getting the book into schools. So because we know at least that way the book is going to be well read and that we're going to be able to inspire the youth. And that's really what the, the mandate was when we set out to make the book is that, you know, for Lily and I, we didn't care about the money as much as we cared about the fact that we could just inspire this next generation to A, you know, not just know the story and the history of the Japanese Canadians, but also to go out and record that history in their own families. So we really want kids and youth, that's why we were hoping we would be more youth today to say, hey, let's talk to mom and dad and turn on the iPhone recorder and actually ask them questions about our family history. Um, you know, one of the greatest things I ever did was I sat down with my grandpa during one big half of family. I didn't just ask him questions about what I was talking about in the documentary. I asked him family history questions and we spent like two, three hours talking and I captured that entire interview. So I have that interview for my grandchildren and my children to watch because my grandpa passed away at 98, no, he was 89 when he passed away a few years ago before my children were born. And so, those resources are invaluable, absolutely invaluable. So I really hope that um, it inspires all of you, you know, to talk to the next generation um, about their history and, and get that down, you know, whether it's written like Lillian's mother did, you know, because that's, we wouldn't have this story if Lillian's mother hadn't written down her family's history. Um, so we really encourage people to, a, you know, get a little tripod, get your camera up there, boom, push record and just film. And uh, you'll always have that. And I think that's that's the true um, beauty of today and technology is that we can capture these stories quite easily. So I'm going to, hey, Lillian, is there anything you wanted to add? Sorry, I felt like I was taking a lot of time there. Um, but yeah, do you want to add anything about where the curriculum's at and everything else? Yeah, we're, uh, we're getting it together and uh, having it field tested in uh, two, two schools in, uh, in Ontario. Uh, but we are changing it around to make it more accessible for teachers. Uh, somebody, I, I can't seem to get a chat in there, but uh, somebody was asking if um, it could be done in French. And yeah, we're working on that as well. Um, I think um, because a good friend of mine is the uh, French consultant for, uh, um, for uh, York Region. So uh, eventually, but right now we just have to handle the vol volume of uh, responses to what we're doing right now, which is to just get the book out, get it into, into um, educational form. And then after that, we can look at uh, Japanese uh, translation. And if there's anybody at your end, you know, who would be willing to translate it into Japanese, that would be a really good help for us. Especially, you know, from the, uh, the, uh, the Buddhist association, there must be people who can, who can write Japanese, right? <laughs> because neither Jeff nor I could do it. That was a tricky one. Yeah, like, you know, both Lillian and I, we don't, we aren't proficient in, in the Japanese language. So even when we did have a little bit of Japanese in the book, we really had to make sure it was accurate because we were so unsure of that. And also, like I said, we're, we're very fortunate that the Landscapes of Injustice team and the National Nikkei Museum, a lot of the researchers uh, came on board early to help us make sure that our research and our, you know, everything in the book is accurate because if we are teaching this uh, to youth we want to make sure that everything is presented in the most current way and the most accurate way as possible too so it went through a lot of rounds of revision to make sure that we could properly convey the information properly because I know a lot of books kind of out and they don't really consult with a lot of the community and we wanted to make sure that um, this book is not just 
you know, entertainment, but, you know, it's educational, it's the edutainment, but, uh, but also, like I said, it's, as Liam said, if we're going to present this in schools, we want to make sure that this is as accurate as possible. And that's why it's also means a lot to us that we have the associations that have come on board. As you can see, here's the book, but uh, we really want to make sure that everybody who helped on the book was represented well. So big thanks um, to making sure that um, we have, you know, the association's backings um, on this book. And uh, it's been really, really helpful for us for sure. So yeah, we've been this whole way, we've had a lot of volunteers and people helping us out. You know, De um, Debbie has been helping Lillian with the curriculum guide building. And, um, you know, I think next steps would be translation. But yeah, if you know anybody, uh, send it, send them our way, because uh, I know that uh, we could definitely use a bit of help in that area. If any, oh, there you go. People are showing us their books. Awesome to the Forest and Geispers family. Did I say your last name? I probably didn't. You guys can, if anybody wants to jump in at any time and just raise your hand and unmute. And if you guys feel comfortable, you want to show us your lovely faces, please do. Um, we love that you guys have the book. That's amazing. Awesome, guys. That's so good and uh, so exciting. But yeah, if anybody wants to just jump and tell, you could tell your own story. You could, you could tell us how your family story relates to this. Um, if you guys um, are talking intergenerationally intergener about these things, we'd love to hear that too, because I think, has the book inspired you? I guess that's the other thing too. What do you think about? Uh... Oh, Jeff. Yeah. I was thinking too, that if there are any children out there and uh, just ideas on what they would like to see happen in, you know, in the next Yukiko book. Oh yeah, what would you guys like to see in the next Yukiko book? Does any any of the kids want to let us know if they want to see Yukiko come back and have more stories? You guys can unmute and let us know. What do you think? What, what, what would you like to see? We'd love to hear from you guys. Do Should we make more books? I guess that's the first one. Anybody? Yeah, we see some thumbs up. Yeah, there we go. Does anybody want to tell us what they want to see in the books? Or is everybody feeling shy this morning? Jeff oh. and Lillian, it's Kathy Turnbull uh, again. Hi, Kathy. Uh, Hi, thank Kathy. you very much for this presentation. Um, it's uh, quite different from the previous one that I had seen. And I just wanted to let you know that my uh, seven-year-old granddaughter read it from cover to cover in one, e one evening oh, uh, at Christmas time. And the question that she raised to me was, why did they have to have a bomb? Mm -hmm. mm, that's a tough one. Um, it was very tough, but uh, she loved the book. I just wanted you to know that all our grandchildren know. Thank you so much for everything you've done for us. Thank you. And you're such a help in the beginning too, Kathy, with, uh, you know, helping us review the book with all of your family. Uh, the whole Turnbull family, I think, read the book uh, early on and uh, gave us great feedback. Um, Lillian, I know that that was you know, it's a, it's a pivotal point in the story. You know, obviously we, it, you can't really shy around that. Um, it's a difficult part of the book. I think that we struggled with uh, making sure that we conveyed that information in a way that wasn't at, you know, taking light of the situation. But, you know, we also got criticism too that, you know, we don't want people, kids to think that, you know, it takes bombs to end wars, right? And we were very careful on the way we were wording that because we didn't want that to make it sound like we were, endorsing violence um, to, to end a war. But I think at the same time, it's important to know that we can't let this happen again. Um, you know, that these atomic bombs should be never, ever, 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 ever used um, in any context whatsoever. Um, but it's also important to note that this happened. Um, so it doesn't happen again. Same thing with the internment. You know what I mean? It's a very difficult, traumatic, um, harsh thing to talk about. This is why there's so much trauma surrounding that with families. But at the same time, you know, because we're talking about personal experience, especially Lillian's family, it's, it's a personal story. Um, this is all things that affected her family. And we wanted to make sure we could accurately reflect that too. Lillian, do you want to talk a, a bit about sort of how you felt with that? I know that that, that that painting in the book is very personal to you. Which one? The bomb. Oh, well, yeah, actually, um, that, that painting was done by my, uh, my Hakujin husband. And he had dementia. And at the time, you know, he, he was painting before that and they're all sort of really lovely uh, uh, pictures. And then he wanted to do this and I could not un understand why he wanted to paint the bomb. And I kind of think that he knew what was happening to himself. And 
I think it was his expression of this is how I feel when I'm being bombed. And uh, yes, we, 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 were, we have to be very careful when we're talking to kids, but then they also need to know that we need to, to uh, you know, voice our, our, our protest against all bombs because all, country, like all of these countries have nuclear weapons and they're all, they know what will happen. I mean, if, it ha if, it, if, they, if they let it go next time, it will be the end of the world. And this is why nobody's really actually done it, but they are, you know, bombing, um, uh, you know, the oceans and whatever and killing off a whole lot of, uh, you know, creatures in the sea. So it's, it's still happening. They're doing the testing. They shouldn't be, but they are. Looks like we have a question down uh, the Boras, Boras family. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your last name properly. Do you guys want to un or unmute and, or you're unmuted? Okay, good. Hi, how are you? What's your name? I'm Annika Boris. Hello, Annika. Oh, Annika. Hey, we have a character in a book called Annika. Mm -hmm. Very, wow. How do you feel about that, seeing your name in a book? I thought it was kind of funny, you know? <laughs> and my great-grandmother worked on a sugar beet farm during the war. Mm -hmm. And in the next book, I think it would be good to maybe see more different mixed characters in their stories. That's a fantastic idea. I know that Lillian has definitely, we want to highlight a lot more of those mixed, mixed stories as well. So what's your, what's your background guys? You've got lots of different things in your family as well? Yeah. Yeah. Or Japanese, We're Japanese English, Nor Swedish, Norwegian, Norwegian, and Dutch. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Fantastic. How did you guys find out about the book? Um, we, we got it got for, for Christmas. Christmas. You did. Yeah. And we heard, we heard about it through the Edmonton Japanese uh, Community Association. Oh, good. Sanai and her crew. Thank you so much. That's uh, awesome to hear. And we're, mm. we're very excited about that. In uh, the other books, I think I'd like to see a little more maybe on more modern Japanese Canadians to oh. compare. To, that would be interesting. I think that's a great idea. And I think we'd love, I think part of Lillian, her idea too, is to bring this into the, the present more as well. And to maybe look at, I don't know, do you want to share some of those ideas you had, Lillian, and see what people think? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I really do think that because um, Mixed, mixed race children are the fastest growing demographic in uh, North America. And uh, so that there are huge numbers in the schools and then there aren't very many books, you know, which address the issues uh, and challenges of, of mixed race people. So, and, and, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, picture books and so forth in the, in the uh, younger race. They talk about individual cultures, black culture, Asian culture, uh, you know, whatever. But I, I do think that they need to feel validated and, and, and a feeling of belonging. And they, and they will if there are more books you know, being produced um, you know, talking about uh, mixed race. And this is why I want to get it into the uh, curriculum so that children really start understanding uh, diversity and to make sure that they never do something that's so terrible as to, um, as to hurt people. And so this is why I'm, you know, wanted to do this. I'm so glad I found a partner in Jeff, because without him, it would have taken me a lot longer, and I don't have that much time. So, but I think it's it's true. It's like it's it's our stories for our peoples. You know what I mean? I think that's that's what's really important is that we're sharing our experiences with other people who have similar experiences, and I think that's really important. You know, it's like stories for us, you know, or for you by us, right? And um, I think that's that's really remarkable to hear and awesome to hear, you know. And I think, you know, we don't want to just talk about sometimes it's just a half and half thing, right? Because of my generation, you know, we used to always say I'm half Japanese. And I realized over time that was what was really cutting me down, you know, is that cutting myself into fractions was not really a great way of seeing myself, you know, knowing that I'm a whole person. So I really kind of discourage the use of fractions um, just because I find that that can sometimes be harmful, which is why I think I gravitated more to using words like hapa and uh, mixed and such um, to feel a sense of wholeness 
knowing that there's parts of me that, you know, make myself up. Now, mind you, I, like I said in the last group, um, it's up to you how you self-identify, right? If you want to be Nikkei, Japanese, Canadian, Yonsei, Sansei, um, mixed, uh, Hapu, Hapa, you know, um, it's up to you. And that's, if it makes you feel good about who you are, then that's great. You know, and I think no one has the right to take that away from you. So I think as a community, we are really taking in the fact that our community is mixed and we're blended. And that's the way we're going to be as we continue forward to the point where we're going to be so mixed and blended that we are just, uh, you know, Japanese Canadian is not going to sort of be associated you know, with the fact that, you know, we have to look Japanese to be Japanese Canadian or to be Nikkei. And I think the more we can kind of, um, you know, gravitate towards that idea, the better off we're going to be moving forward and, and embracing more of our community in, into um, these associations and groups. And you're seeing that more with the Japanese Young Leaders Association. A lot of them are HAPA. And um, a lot of people who are working at the Nikkei National Museum, HAPA, Powell Street, a lot of them are HAPA. And I think that's great. You know, I think we're taking an active role in wanting to embrace um, Yes, that's, that's me. <laughs> I drew that one. Um, you know, so I think that's great. You know, I, I'm really happy that the younger generation, um, you know, is being able to have these discussions and conversations with their parents um, based on some of what we're tackling in the book, right? And, I, and for some people, it's the first time you've actually seen that. And I know for Lillian and I, it means so much that like grandparents are sitting down with their grandkids and reading it together. You know, this might be the first time in like 50 years a grandparents read a comic book, right? But, uh, you know, I think that's amazing that, you know, they can sit down and when Lillian and I, we did a, a reading for the Japanese language school and it was just a reading. We didn't do a presentation. We just read the book. Um, and we think we had 300 Japanese uh, preschool kids joining us that probably did not understand a single word that was coming out of our mouth. But they sat there and they listened for 45 minutes and it was fantastic and it was amazing. And um, we're hoping we can do that again, uh, just have like a reading. Um, you know, I, I read Emma's part and then uh, uh, poor, poor Lily and you had to read everything else, all the, the whole histor historical part. But um, what I liked about that was that it was just sharing the story with people and um, being able to come together and hear it being read out loud. So thank you so much for, for everyone who's read the book together, I think, and discussed the book together, because this book is a book that needs discussion, especially amongst families, because it should incite dialogue. It should incite um, the need and the want to learn more about your own family histories, which is really what Lillian and I set out to do. Um, are there any other kind of questions that anyone had or comments you'd like to, to give? We'll maybe do Just a couple more. I uh, say one thing. Okay, yes. Hi, uh, everybody. My name is Junko Bailey. I am originally from Japan. I'm from Nagasaki. So uh, growing up in Japan, we, uh, we talk about the atomic bomb all the time, every summer we have the memorials and all that so uh but besides the point now i'm the mother of a six-year-old and the three-year-old here mm -hmm. and uh once i became the mother i start to see a struggle in the uh, my own identity as a japanese person in canada and i also mm -hmm. start to see my kids uh their, their father is caucasian so they're half then I start to realize like, oh yeah, they are going to go through this identity uh, issues. And I wanted to uh, find out more about what the, the Japanese Canadians go through. So that's how I get in, really interested in the, the histories and the, you know, the second, third, fourth generation, what they're going through and also the language problem because I'm teaching my boys Japanese and I start to see how difficult it is to continue the language. And my, sorry, my kids are crying, but. So uh, yeah, this book would be really uh, uh, great for my kids growing up and also for me, my, my generation as well. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, and that's, I think it's great that we can have people of, you know, all generations, like I say, participate in this kind of dialogue. And um, I think it is, it, it tells, you know, like a, a very historical story, but at the same time, you know, we are starting new chapters in all of our lives, right, as, as new Canadians, and I think it's important to know, you know, the, the stories that came before us, obviously, and um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Lillian, do you want to comment? Yeah, or? There's, there's one more thing that I would like to uh, say. 
Uh, I was approached uh, actually before this book came out and I got really busy by a, a young um, um, sensei, uh, well, we're not so young anymore, but a sensei, <laughs> sensei woman who uh, really wanted to explore the, the sensei experience. And, you know, the more I, I um, you know, work, work in, the, in this, this area, I realized that the sensei are actually a lost generation. Uh, a lot has been written about the past uh, internment history, and now we're moving to, and, and a lot uh, has been done too for the, uh, you know, by the Yonsei for uh, mixed race identity through film and um, plays and, and writing. So, but there's, I don't think there's anything that's been done on the Sansei who chose to marry outside the culture and why did we do that? So I'm gonna contact that woman to see uh, if there are people who want to share a story, it could be anonymous, whatever. If any, if you know of anyone who would like to do this, you know, please uh, let me know, because I think it's uh, important to know. I, I really feel that we're we're the generation that's sort of left in limbo, feeling more Canadian and less Japanese, but looking more Japanese and less Canadian. And um, you know, growing up, uh, we're half the culture, you know, that persecuted us and half the culture who were the victims. And I think that has uh, really colored a lot of the issues and problems that I've had, challenges that I've had with my own life and uh, coming to terms with being Japanese Canadian. And the past is really, really important to know who you are completely. So if anybody has any ideas about this, you know, please uh, contact your uh, organizations and they'll let me know. Thank you. Can yeah. I just uh, say sure. something, Jeff? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Who is speaking? Yeah, it's Kelly. Hi, Kelly. I, I'm not sure why I'm not coming up in speaker view, but that, but that's okay. Uh, so you, you know what? I, I think your book is very, very timely. As an organization, an executive on an organization, we're beginning to identify that there's a there's a problem at hand, and that problem is, what is the succession of your organization? We're seeing that the Sansei, Yonsei, uh, Gosei individuals are finding less of a reason to be part of a membership because they've lost their identity. And I think your, your timing of this book is perfect. And I think it's something that we need to really hold up to these individuals to say, you know, you have a membership for a reason. But even more so, I'm not sure what the other organizations are seeing, but our new Issei, so the Junko Baileys, um, the new Issei, are really going to be an integral part of our organizations. So I don't know if you've ever given thought to trying to write a book on how that, that succession plan takes place, how we integrate new ESA to founding members of these organizations to, to come together as one. Yeah, that's in that it's hard because I'd like you know, the reason I, I present, you know, the work I do is because it comes from personal experience, right? Um, it's often drawn from my experience or from those that I've spoken to. There's a lot of other Yonsei uh, mixed Japanese like Julie Tomiko Manning who are doing amazing work um, with the Tashmi Project. I think they have a graphic novel coming out. So it's a lot, you know, and I know that she's covering the history as well too within that project, but you're right. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's I don't want to say it's hard for me to approach that topic from a per first hand perspective. I have friends, you know, obviously are Issei and, and um, there's a lot, but I kind of feel like it's, it's, it's up to them to tell the story as well too. Right. You know, I think it's, it's, it gives an authentic voice. Um, you know, whereas Lillian can speak to her experience because she has an authentic voice. Um, and I feel like that generation, you know, may start to create more work as well too, because there is this certain sense of, um, diaspora right um of kind of living outside of japan and and living in a new community um and that's what we're seeing too at the national nikkei museum or the the nikkei cultural center is that there's more and more of these um, groups that are meeting and collectively coming together and i i always think it's interesting you know how are they seeing our history you know as japanese canadians have being here for many generations 
and how are they reflecting on what happened um, during World War II, knowing what was happening in Japan at the time. So I'd like to see more parallels, right, of, of kind of what was going on in Japan with what was going on here and how the differing sides maybe were, you know, seeing each other, I guess, in that way. Because, you know, like I said, I'd like to know more of the story of when, you know, Lillian's grandmother went to Japan after the war with her kids, right? Um, because that's a story that I don't see as reflected as much, but I know is very difficult because they were going to a war-torn country and they were being seen as the enemy, right? Coming, you know, why are you coming back, right? Um, and I, I think that's something that's rarely told. So I think there's a lot of stories that need to be, to be explored. Um, and, you know, this is just scratching the surface, obviously Lillian and I's, um, but I know that there's definitely more and more. So I, I, that's why I guess I encourage all of you, you know, to find ways to creatively tell these stories, right? Um, you know, and, and, and now telling them with your, your kids too. I think that's also why it's important that Lillian and I have this intergenerational, you know, novel that is really a true reflection of being an intergenerational collaboration, right? Um, through a Sansei and a Yonsei. So we do need an Issei and an Issei and a Yonsei and a Gosei. You know, maybe that's the next step is to do a, a, a book about the five generations right now. And now I don't even know what you would call the sixth generation. Anyone, anyone know? Like what is, what comes after Gosei? Do we know yet? I don't know. <laughs> So that's, I think that's, that, that's coming. And I, I really feel like that's, um, that there will be more and more of these stories that will come out. Um, so Junko, I, I hope that you're, you're thinking about that too, um, about how you tell your story, um, because your story is important, um, especially for our community, because we are that you are the next real generation that's going to continue the legacy of Japanese Canadians as well. So yeah, I just wanted to mention something that, uh, uh, I am actually um, trying to produce a film, a documentary about the new essay in, in Manitoba, and also I have an idea about uh, panel discussion between the new essay like me and the Japanese Canadians and talk about our gaps and some stuff that we think about, but very difficult and sensitive to talk about. Those issues are there. But I think there, we could find a way to discuss it just like this Zoom or any different ways. And I think we could do it. You know, we all, you know, have the same uh, ancestors and we have the common interest of keeping our culture alive for our next generations. And I think this is a really a good time to uh, uh, really do this project of uh, panel discussion. And I think we could do different groups of uh, uh, discussion, like say uh, Sansei and the new new generation, like a new Issei, or the Yonsei and Gosei and new Issei. And then we could talk about different points, like a language or the culture or the, you know, how we look at the, uh, our identity in Canada. So there's lots of um, uh, topic that we could discuss. And that makes me happy, right? So there we go, Kelly, there's, uh, there's your answer. Uh, we already have um, media in the works. And like I said, the best thing to do is tell our stories through film, books, theater, all the arts. Um, and I think that's all we could really ask for. So the more we can create, um, the better. And I, I really encourage everyone to capture your own stories in some way, somehow. And then, you know, if you're comfortable, share it, you know, share it with everyone. I think the Japanese Canadian group on Facebook is a valuable resource for everyone to share information, to share what the community is doing. Like I said, I think we sold the majority of all of our books because of that amazing Facebook group that was started, I think, by John Endo Greenaway from the Bulletin. So, um, you know, big honor or big big ups to that because that that's a great way for us to connect and stay connected. Um, so, you know, love social media all you want. Anyways, Roger, you gotta- Yeah. Kelly, uh, you know, before we lose this opportunity, uh, uh, you, you raised the the point about the about the new uh, the new Issei and and the uh, the future of your organization. And and I'm here in in Calgary, and and we've had the same kind of conversation at, at our uh, board level. And and so certainly, uh, uh, as Junko had uh, suggested, uh, uh, I think uh, there are some conversations that. Uh, you know that that we need to have uh, to, to to share some of these ideas. So I'll I'll be in contact with you, Kelly. And, uh... <laughs> Sorry, yeah. can I just uh, insert myself? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Izumi. 
uh, from Toronto. Um, hi, Lillian. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for a great presentation and great book. And I love all this. Oh, look at yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been enjoying quite a bit of this, uh, my nine-year-old son. Um, and so he, his suggestion was also to have something with atomic bomb. I think he, it, uh, I've been talking to him about Japanese Canadian internment and that uh, first time I show him the pictures, maybe a few years ago when he was maybe five or six, he was shocked that uh, Japanese Canadians went through such hardship. Um, and this made it more relevant to his generation, like what it would be the kinds of conversations that they might be having. So it was really helpful to have this. Um, and so he requests uh, to read this at his bedtime to we all go through this few pages at a time um, after we have gone through this uh, whole thing already. Um, and uh, so to, um, just tag along with the conversation that's been happening. I'm an immigrant myself. I've been in Canada for 18 years, 19 years, and uh, I'm a researcher at University of Toronto. And uh, um, so we don't know uh, yet, but um, I'm applying for a grant uh, from the government to do the research on uh, Japanese Canadian identities. So, um, so, so the, the vision is to have different uh, focus group type of thing, group discussions for different groups of people. So um, Shinji Shao, first generation, um, middle aged people and who are older seniors, uh, Sansei, Yonsei, Gosei and so forth. And to sort of uh, explore uh, what it means to be Japanese Canadians or Japanese in Canada um, and uh, and also how to relate to racism that happens and that's ongoing anti-Japanese, anti-Asian racism um, and other kinds of racism also happening in Canada um, and how to situate ourselves, situate ourselves in it. Um, so um, I, if we get it, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be in touch with some of you, but just wanted to, it's, it's exciting that many people are thinking about similar things and I hope that um, that will lead to documentations of um, different identities. Thanks. That's Yuzumi, great. I'd just like to point out many of the uh, cultural associations have grants available. We have a community uh, grant available. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to come from a, a local organization. So you should look uh, at all of the organizations to see if there's a grant you might be able to tap into. Not large dollars, but you know, uh, Two to three thousand dollars is not unheard of to help uh, fund projects like this. Okay, thank yeah, you. So much. And the endowment fund um, is also good. The NAJC endowment fund. I'm sure you know about that one. You know, it's there's there's great resources out there. And thanks, Kelly. I think that's that's great. These these organizations, these associations have funding to help with these types of projects. And I know that the the NAJC Toronto group is very active as well um, with uh, Lynn over there. So. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a valuable thing that we have all these associations across Canada that um, that now you know we can use Zoom to come together like this, right? Whereas in the past uh, it's sometimes tricky because Lily and I would be traveling in a plane to 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 see all you in person, which we miss. But at the same time, uh, this is a great opportunity to bring together communities to have these discussions. And so I encourage everyone, you know, down the road this should be an ongoing thing, you know, aside from the book, you know, if there are ways that these associations are able to maybe have a monthly meetup with other groups and other associations, other people who are interested, this is a great way to bring the community together to have these talks and discussions, you know, in an intergenerational way too, you know, because we should be involving the youth. We're so, I, I'm elated that we have youth, you know, in this presentation, because in the past, you know, um, a lot of times it's just us, us adults, right? Um, so, very exciting um, to see the youth. And you know, if we could think of more things to involve the youth, youth with in this way, I, I think we should really put our heads together and do that, right? Which is why I keep making kids books, you know, for my kids and and hopefully uh, you know, you you will also find ways to do that. So, but even like I said, just reading Yukiko with uh, your grandkids or your children is a step in the right direction, right? And um, you know, it's getting that dialogue and conversation going. So I want to be mindful of time. I know that we all have busy days ahead of us and some of us haven't eaten lunch yet or breakfast like myself. So um, again, huge thank you to, to all of the associations, uh, Manitoba, Edmonton, Calgary, and the, and the Calgary Buddhist Temple 
for putting together this amazing event and bringing all of you together. Um, and again, stay in touch. The Japanese Canadian Facebook group is a great place to do that. I put my email up there if you want to get in touch with me. Izumi put her email up too. So if you want to keep in touch with her. Um, very great. So I encourage you in the next couple of minutes, if you want to put something in the chat uh, as ways to stay in touch, do that, please. But um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and Lillian, do you want to say anything before we part? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to keep in touch with uh, and Junko uh, Bailey, just because um, I know that it's a uh, it's really difficult, you know, for new Canadians of any sort. But this is, you know, I I really would like those uh, new new um, Issei to uh, to understand that we are here as a support group. So anyway, um, can you send your email address to to Jeff, and then? Uh, if I find people, I, I know of a couple of people, it's just getting them to talk, but then we'll, we'll work on that <laughs> and, um, and see if I could find, you know, some people who are, uh, uh, are able to do this for you. Lillian, I can put your email address in the chat. You want me to do that? Oh, okay. 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 Here's Lillian's email address. So if you want to get a hold of Lillian too, um, we're very accessible. Uh, we're busy, but we're accessible. So if any of you have questions or want to follow up or, um, have any comments or ideas, uh, send them our way. You know what I mean? If it, it might take me a bit of time just because like I said, I'm juggling many things. Um, but we'll always try and, you know, get back to you and, and, and see how we can work together on things. So awesome. Thank you so much. This has been a, a very, uh, very, very nice morning um, and uh, very inspirational, I think, uh, for me. And I know for Lillian as well, too. And, and for all the groups, like I said, it's, it's very pivotal that um, we look at the health of our associations and how we are able to go forth into the future and encourage more people to be part of our community and feel embraced by our community. So this is a great step in the right direction, I think, for everyone to work together on that. And uh, hopefully there will be more presentations to come down the road. So with that being said, hey, good seeing all your faces. If you guys want to open up your cameras, if you feel comfortable, if you're not uh, wearing your pajamas or just uh, give a little wave goodbye to everybody. Bye. Thanks for showing up, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, keep in touch and uh, spread spread the word about the book and leave your reviews. And we appreciate all of your amazing support. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Have, yeah, a wonderful, right. have a wonderful day, everybody. Hey, before everyone goes, I just want to uh, to thank uh, Jeff and Lillian for the opportunity to hear your stories. Um, I want to thank you also for your, your uh, work over the years. Um, to keep the, uh, the the history of Japanese Canadians alive and and uh, never to be forgotten, you know that this this uh, could be a uh, conversation starter uh, to have that talk with uh, with some of our our youth. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's a someone else mentioned it's a great way to introduce that topic, uh, whereas some of the uh, adult level books is, is pretty. Uh, uh, you know, pr pretty hard for them to to get into. So uh, again, Jeff and, and Lillian, thank you so much. It's been a, uh, an incredible morning, uh, another, uh, and, and I, I find that, uh, as you said, Jeff, uh, it, it's it's become a, an international uh, affair and, and the word is spreading. And, and uh, you know, certainly I, I intend to continue to, uh, to get the word out there because, uh, you know, as as so many people have said, it's a great way to bring the the, the younger, the youth into uh, uh, into the conversation. Uh, so uh, again, on behalf of all of us, I I, I counted uh, uh, forty four of us on uh, on it at one time, and and uh, so thank you so much, and and uh, I wish you well in the project. There's been some great ideas, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to uh, to more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Thank afternoon. You. And uh, we will hopefully see your lovely faces again, hopefully in person, some way down the road. All right. Have <laughs> a great afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye.